All right. We are live. Good evening, everyone. It is December 30th, 2020. We are almost done with this year, you all. Praise the Lord. We're almost done with 2020. It is our great pleasure to be with you this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm just going to look here and make sure that we are on. We are on and we have folks tuning in. Thank you so much. So tonight we are part two of four of explaining the cattle long range plan. In mid-December, the RCAP Board of Directors launched a long range plan that provides direction for the cattle industry and guidance for our lawmakers. And tonight we have some new faces with us, um, bright shining faces, some, some newbies here on Facebook Live and Facebook Zoom. And so we're so pleased to have you all. We're gonna start with board member Eric Groper. Eric, you're our Region 10 board member out of South Dakota. You represent all of the Native American reservations across the country. And so thank you so much for being with us. Next, we'll go to Shad Sullivan. Shad, you are the region director for number five, the great state of Texas. And uh, we're so glad to have you. You're a, you are a, um, a veteran Facebook yeah. liker. So, and then we will go to um, Gerald Schreiber. Gerald, you uh, represent region number two. You're the president of RCAF. Uh, and you represent Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. And then tonight we have a special guest, which we're so excited. We have decided to expand beyond the scope of our board of directors and um, really just highlight the fact that it, this is not just a national movement. We have many, many different state associations on board. Kurt Warner, you are the president of the Colorado Independent Cattle Growers Association. And I'm going to give you just a few minutes here. Thank you for being with us. Uh, explain, explain to us or express your thoughts a little bit about why it's so important for cattle producers, if they're a member of RCAF or not a member of RCAF, to really link arms and get on board with this cattle long range plan. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Uh, this is a five year plan. I don't know that we have five years. Uh, we are in a large part of the country in a, in a serious drought. There's going to be a lot of people go out of business. I'm not sure that um, there's going to be people to replace them when the, the cattle cycle turns around. Uh, when you sit in the sale barns, and I'm kind of a, uh, an auction market junkie, I guess I follow you know auction markets across the country. But here locally, when you sit in the sale barn and there's only two or three people buying cattle, because we've lost all the independent cattle uh, feeders. Uh, it's not a very good feeling. And, and you see it, see how it affects uh, cattle prices. Yeah, your, 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 your best steers might bring a decent price. Heifers are, are falling back more all the time because they're just, there isn't any feedlot capacity anymore. And then you, everybody has these odds and ends of calves, um, late calves, or maybe a calf that was, uh, you know, off of a heifer or something. And on certain days, they're almost unsaleable. And that all goes into your average as, as a cattle producer. And it all goes back to, you know, uh, the consolidation of the, of the packing industry, which has eliminated um, thousands of thousands of cattle feeders. And uh, uh, it's worked its way back into um, to the cow-calf producers. Mm -hmm. Yes, it absolutely is. Are you a cow-calf producer there in Colorado? Yes. Okay. And um, friends with the, the late, great uh, Kimmy Lewis, we yes. miss her so much and we're so thankful for affiliates like the Colorado Independent Cattle Growers and the Independent Stock Growers or Wyoming Stock Growers. And we have Oklahoma, they have an affiliate. If you are watching and your state does not have an RCAF affiliate, please contact us. We, there are cattle producers coming on board with RCAF all the time. And we would love, love, love to go and have a meeting in your state and also have an affiliate in your state. It's just, it's time to link arms. Um, and last but not least- Let me interrupt because Kurt just yeah. said two very important things. Uh, number one, we may not have five years. Uh, number two, there are, um, elements within the industry structure that is working directly against the cattle producer, and that is primarily a loss of competition. What he's bringing up is that uh, 
there are far more issues of critical importance to the profitability of cattle producers than simply growing beef demand and expanding beef exports. Mm -hmm. And that's what's been lacking in this industry for decades is there has not been a priority to the concerns and the needs of independent cattle producers. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads us to why this five-year plan was put together. But very importantly about the five-year plan is it contains solutions to the immediate problem to reverse or at least halt, to halt the downward trajectory that we're experiencing and to give us an opportunity to have far more than five years. But he's absolutely right, it's, it's urgent now and the plan does address the urgency, but as well as uh, where we go after we have stopped the collapse of this industry. So just wanted to add that. No, that's powerful. The whole reason that we, we as RCAF came up with the cattle long range plan was because the industry came up with the beef long range plan um, in July of this last year. And it was at the NCBA summer meeting paid for by your, and this plan was paid for by your checkoff dollars. And when several board members, <clears throat> uh, you Shad Sullivan being one of them, read that plan on Facebook, Brett Kinsey being the other, it really kind of put a burr under your saddle pad. And you said, wait a minute, this, as Bill said, just doesn't even address what's actually really going on because of course the beef industry is different than us which we're the cattle piece and so um i'm going to ask you the same question i asked jay platt last week which was that uh why does we why did we uh why did you as an rcaf board member make that phone call to brett kinsey to bill bullard and say we need to do something immediately to present a different plan well I think it all comes back to what Kurt was just talking about, and uh, it gets pretty uh, pretty simple. We like to make it hard. We like to get all this mass of confusion going together, but it all comes down to one thing, and that's the bottom line. Where are our bottom lines as beef producers? Where have they been historically? Where have they been in the last five years, and where are they at currently? And uh, I think we need to it's time to address that. We've got to um, uh, get producers together. Uh, we've got to get wholesome, true producers um, together and start figuring out how we can become a, a profitable industry. You see, we have so much going against us. So we have uh, the um, environmental movement going against us. We have our own tax dollar being used in a way that is not lifting up us as producers. We have uh, monopolization, those breaking antitrust laws coming in against us. And so if we're going to save an industry and what we're saving this industry for is the future, in my opinion, um, we've got to come together now. We've got to figure it out and we have to increase that bottom line. I'm a yearling guy. Um, in my specific operation, I know where I'm at every single day. So if I get halfway through the year, I can see, you know, I, I start a year and I end a year on a certain date. But some uh, operations, they are uh, diversified enough or maybe they carry so much over um, into the next year, they never quite know where we're at. So that's why you have some producers still hanging on to the hope that there is a future here. But the true fact is, if you are figuring um, everything that comes into the cost of production in, we are not making money. That's why we've all done this. It's the bottom line. It's about profitability. We want to feed the world. We can feed the world. We have the expertise to feed the world. We have the knowledge. We have the environmental knowledge, the factor. We, we, we've become incredible producers in the last um, 30 to 40 years. Let us do our job. Give us a fair playing field. It's all about competition, right? A supply and demand. And if anybody says that this market is supply and demand driven in the last five years, that's wrong. It's just not happening. So that's why... 
you know, we've come together and said, you know, we're just ranchers. We're volunteering our time here. We want a ranch, but uh, we got a problem because there's not going to be an ability to, to ranch. And then we, you know, some of us have uh, kids that we want to, you know, give the opportunity at least to come back. And so it's about the future and it all inter is interwoven within the future of our nation, you know, so that's why we've done it, Tatum. We want a future in the beef industry. Mm -hmm. As a tag to that, Shad, this isn't about our calf. It's not about our calf members. It's not about our calf, the association. This really is an olive branch to, to stretch out to say, regardless of affiliation, if you wear the RCAF badge or the NCBA badge, what badge, whatever badge you wear, we're all producers at the end of the day. And it's time, you know, that we need to link arms. And so, you know, we would, we would, we would submit to all those watching and it looks like um, we we have over 50 people watching us online right now. Thank you so much. We are asking you get on board with us. Get on board with us as grassroots producers. Help us save this industry. We do not care what side of the aisle you're on. We well, I think it's I'm sorry. Yeah, please. It's important to realize that the majority of cattle producers are not aligned with any organization. I mean, we have 3% of the producers uh, affiliated with one organization, you know, five to 6,000 uh, affiliated with the, other, with the other two organizations across America. That means there's, you know, uh, 97, 96% of producers left in the country have no affiliation, have no loyalty to an organization. And that's fine. But I urge those I urge those producers right now, look at your bottom line, be truthful about it, see where you're at. Are you profitable? Are you happy with the regulatory changes coming your way? Are you happy with the um, uh, property rights uh, attacks on your, on your industry? You may be east of the 110th prime meridian uh, and don't have that problem. But west of the 110th prime meridian, we have a problem out here. In, in that area. There are so many other liabilities coming to us. You know, it's not just the weather. We have all these things attacking our industry. And I ask, I beg, I plead, I say, producers, come on, let us feed the world. Let's feed the world at a profit. And, and, and you know, you want to talk sustainability, let's become sustainable within ourselves and help us, help us become and do what, uh, do what we want to do. And that's produce food for the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a producer call me let this last week. He's a backgrounder from Eastern Kansas. And he called to apologize, actually. He said, Tatum, he called and he said, the environmentalists are coming in. And he asked me to go and to go to bat for him and to ask and, and to, to make a few phone calls for him. And I would love to do that. And I'm happy to do it. And I said, now do you see why our cap exists and why we need to help you? And he goes, I'm so sorry. He goes, I'll send in my membership dues. He goes, because he's a guy who doesn't want to be part of any association. I'm not a membership guy. And yeah. yet when he got in a crack, he called me because he needed, yeah. he needed some support. And well, so that we need to be together, right? I mean, we need to link arms and, and tell the next guy next door, you're not alone because a lot of people out there with their bottom lines, I mean, here we are again, I'm saying it again, up 25% in, in farm bankruptcies this year and, and people are down. It's not just COVID. This stuff was all happening before COVID. We need to pat each other on the back, say, you're not alone. Let's fix this to where we can be more competitive on, a, on not only a global scale, but on a national scale. Let's be nationalists first. Let's take care of our national producers very first. Amen. Yes. Uh, you know, you said something that's so powerful and it's so simple. Our calf exists really for two reasons, to be profitable and stay independent. That's it. Yeah, that's right. That's that's completely it. That's who we are. Gerald Schreiber, Bill uh, tonight expressed it, or yesterday rather, expressed in his weekly radio address that tonight we're gonna we're gonna go through the second and the third strategies. And one of the things that I really love that Bill said um, is that these strategies tonight really speak to the heart uh, and soul of the plan and why our calf exists because it talks about the liberty and the freedom piece. And so please speak to how this plan does prioritize freedom and liberty and our constitutional rights as producers. Well, thank you, Tatum, and good evening, everybody. 
Uh, our plan is different than the plan that was uh, released in July. And one fundamental difference, and we're all, whatever group you're in, uh, independence is a very important thing. Uh, what we do on Schreiber Ranch, I mean, I make my own management decisions with my wife and we want to perpetuate that as a business, but we have to be profitable uh, to do that. And, and Chad and everybody has talked about uh, uh, profitability and, and we need to talk about economic sustainability. But our plan is very specific to helping individual ranchers and feeders stay in business. And one thing as RCAP members, uh, we have, we see a trend toward vertical integration in our business and it's something you can't deny. I mean, we deal with four packers handling about 84% of, of the product. We, we deal, uh, I'm a cow calf producer and we're ultimately dependent upon what fat cattle or slaughter cattle, I guess that's the correct term in this day and age, do and, and we realize it doesn't matter what group you're in that that uh, sector of our business that that's basically sets our prices all the way down is based on a cash market that has become very thin, uh, less than 5% in the uh, high plains. So our plan is very specific to, to keeping individual producers and, uh, and keeping our businesses independent of becoming vertically integrated and yet we, we seek profitability. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've relied on, uh, and we talked a little about this a couple weeks ago, uh, you know, we've relied on uh, Congress and we've relied on our uh, Secretary of Agriculture to basically be the referee as independent producers, we don't have the market power uh, when we get into the market to uh, deal with these packers. And as their power has increased, uh, we've seen, as Kurt mentioned earlier, less farmer feeders. Uh, I ran into a guy yesterday in Brush uh, that used to feed cattle. And I said, why'd you quit? He said, well, we got tired of working all winter and putting our feed crop uh, into the feed and then not getting a return back. So he said, we, we did that several years and we finally quit. But our plan is very specific to uh, keeping individual liberty. And uh, as opposed to the other plan, uh, you know, we don't have any problem with uh, animal identification. Uh, if you want to do it in your program to enhance your marketability, we think that's your right, but we don't believe that government should mandate. And that's a definite contrast. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, that's one of the contrasting points. We're, we, as RCAF, uh, we're, we're going to fight mandatory RFID. We don't think it should be government imposed. And that's, uh, that's another thing that, uh, uh, you know, to keep our individual liberty. Uh, we think uh, the checkoff should be at least voted on. We're working on a program right now to have a referendum. We don't think that a lot of producers, as Shad said, uh, a lot of producers aren't affiliated, but we've paid the, into this checkoff for, I don't know, 30 years, never been a vote on it. Uh, we've had one contractor. Uh, we and, and other cattle organizations haven't been participants. Uh, one thing uh, that we are all guilty of is we've depended on other people to lobby and represent us. And I think all of us, it's incumbent upon RCAP members to become more involved. We're wonderful producers, you all know that. Uh, we do a great job of producing, but we have ignored, uh, we've depended on other people to lobby for us and uh, it just hasn't worked. So I think our plan is a template to go to uh, it was pointed out on a conference call I was on last night. We need to go to start out with our county commissioners, our state commissioners of agriculture, our governor, and then of course our national. We learned this summer through conference calls uh, when we were pushing uh, uh, try to try to get more support for Senator Grassley's bill, for the Grassley tester bill. Uh, we found out that we can be our own lobbyists through conference calls. Those people need to be educated. 
and and to maintain back to your question to maintain our individual liberty we've got to become more active we can't just have bill bowler doing it and i think that's that was my attitude uh, when i first got into our oh we have this great uh, not uh, bill not that you're not great but we you're, you're our advocate well you can't be our advocate everyone on this call and everybody that's watching on the other side we have to become more involved i mean it's just as important as uh, being out there in a storm in the spring and saving those calves. I mean, uh, we have got to be involved at all levels and we can't depend on the Farm Bureau or the, the Cattlemen's Group to, to carry the ball for us. We've got to carry the ball. And Tatum and I come back, that's how we maintain our independence and liberty. Uh, we've got to become involved and, and allocate the time to do that. This, this long range plan is, is something that we've got to educate. Uh, we've got to educate our legislators, our commissioner of agriculture, because the wrong people have been influencing those people. So we've got a lot of work to do. You know, I think that's the best speech I've ever heard you give, Gerald. <laughs> I love that. That is so it true. No, it's, it's so, it, because it's so candid. It's so honest. We all have to get involved. That's why I called Bill Bullard five years ago when I moved back to our family place. And I said, uh, how can I help you? Because those that were tasked to help us, I just, man, they've been selling this down the river. And so, yeah, COVID-19 has shown us, hasn't it, that we can be citizen lobbyists with, with uh, conference calls and they will listen and we can loop our CEO in. So if you're watching and you're thinking, man, this is great, how do I get involved? That's an easy, easy way. Call your Senator, call your Congressman, call us, we'll give you Bill Bullard's cell phone number, get him on a phone with your Congressman and get involved. That is, this, this plan um, speaks to the heart of that is this is going to have to be all of us literally do making those phone calls and not just making a phone call, leaving a message and then walking away, but building those relationships with those lobbyists and those different offices and get involved. Um, you know, Eric Groper, I'm going to go to you. Um, are, were you, you were one of those, you're new to RCAF, or you're at least new no. to the board of RCAF. And um, you were one of those who you finally said, it's time. It's time I get involved. And we appreciate you stepping up. We appreciate your leadership. You've been such a joy to get to know. And you're so funny. Uh, and I just appreciate you so much. Talk to us a little bit about why you got involved with RCAF, because you used to be just one of those guys kind of thinking, man, something's wrong, but I don't really know what to do. Oh, precisely. After the Holcomb County fire and I seen what it done to our markets, I called Bill directly. I'm president of the Ogallala Livestock and Landowners Association here on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And, and, uh, We've signed on with RCAF over the years on a lot of letters that went to DC and senators and whatnot. And after that Holcomb County fire, I was just disgusted. And I called Bill and I said, I'll do anything you need me to do. And I guess he told me what I needed to do and and got me involved and and pretty soon I was appointed to the board. So uh, I guess if I can get here, anybody can you know, but uh, I just wanted to get involved and know what was going on. And it's a great place to be. It opened my eyes. I'm just a cow calf guy in Southwest South Dakota. I didn't know. I didn't have a clue the amount of stuff that goes on in the cattle industry and how, what a big monopoly there is on it. It's just ridiculous. So I guess that's how I got involved. Um, I don't know what more you want to know now. No, well, no, love being I, part of the team. Well, we love having you as part of the team. What did you think? Um, we're going to plug our convention here just real quick because you came for the first time. Our convention is next August, and you were like, "Oh my stars!" <laughs> yeah, that might have not been the exact phrase you used, but it was close. Probably not. Yeah, it was. It was. It was amazing. There was. It makes you feel. Every one of our speakers, they keep you tuned in because it's all about what we do. It's all, that's the one thing I want to say about this board is, is 
we are the ranchers of America. You know, we are, we are you people that are not affiliated or, or in our calf. Our board is ranchers and farmers and feedlot guys and stockers from across the nation. None of us are politicians. We're, we've all got a dog in a fight, you know, we're all trying to survive. And that's the beauty part about our calf. It's about as grassroots as you can get. Well, are you sure it's not that big paycheck we pay you every month? Or <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. I'd love to do it. <laughs> our calf sport is, com is completely voluntary and we appreciate you. I feel like Bill wants to jump in for just a minute. Yeah, er Eric makes an important point, an extremely important point. And that is that the, the major problems associated with this industry are far downstream from the cow-calf producer. They are, as Gerald said, uh, they originate at the feedlot level where the cattle in the feedlot are sold directly to the packers. Right. And so cow-calf producers have no reason to pay attention to that. And the groups that have been directing the policy have been kind of an elite club um, and has purposely kept cattle producers in the dark. And so that's what Eric recognized was there is a lot of depth to this industry that has been completely withheld from cow-calf producers. And that's why this has been such a difficult fight is because we recognized early on where the problem was. And the problem was in the sale of those fat cattle because that marketplace, as Gerald said, translates to the value of cattle of all ages and weights. And yet uh, people were far removed from that. So we, we've gone way downstream in the supply chain to identify the problem. And now we're bringing the information back upstream. So cow-calf producers, stockers, backgrounders, purebred breeders, they all can have a better understanding of what's really happening in this industry uh, and how it's uh, in the process of being taken away from the cow-calf producers and backgrounders and stockers. And that's what we're fighting against right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For me, one of the things that really jumped out when I came on board our calf, Eric, is the use or is, is this, this battle to use um, RFID tags in a mandatory way, which I didn't realize at the time uh, until I started researching that those mandatory RFID tags actually are associated with site maps on your map. And it's really just kind of a government big brother, honestly. And so RCAF has filed a lawsuit um, with a couple of RCAF members as plaintiffs and we're thankful for them. We've been successful thus far. And again, just so everybody knows, we're not against, are we Eric, RFID tax for your own personal operation. Oh. But when the government starts mandating those, that's where we have a problem. Um, talk to us a little bit about your opinion on those mandatory RFID tags, because you cover a lot of country up there in South Dakota. Well, yeah, and it's it, RFID is mandatory RFID is pure government overreach. It's not it's not benefiting the producer in any way that I can see. We they talk about traceability. We already have traceability through bangs tags brands. I mean, if there's a sick critter going to kill they can trace it back within about three days no matter what you know even if it's out of the country so if you want to mandate something give me a reason why that's a decent reason not just traceability when we already have that mm -hmm. next is what shad was talking to about your bottom line it's going to cost me why would i why would i want that my bottom line's bad the way it is you know so why I just don't see the point of it. Um, the other side will throw M cool at us and say, well, that's that's government overreach. Well, no, because you're providing the consumer with a choice. Do you want American beef or do you want foreign beef? I just don't I just don't see it, Tatum. I don't see the necessity for RFID is mandatory unless you look for what they're really going after. And that's, that's exactly. control. That's control. Mandated control. You nailed it. Shad Sullivan, we talk about this all the time. I want to I want to touch on this because this is really at the core of all lot of a lot of these issues, which is 
mandated control. And, and that's what you and I have talked about the global roundtable for sustainable beef. That's a mandated control program. The other side as Eric. So Eric, you're doing so great on your zoom debut. We're so proud of you, by the way, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> what the other side says is that uh, our calf, you cannot fight against mandatory RFID and then want mandatory cool on in the same breath. Talk to us about that Shad. Well, I say, yes, we can. And the reason I say, yes, we can is because mandatory country of origin labeling is a freedom maker. Mandatory radio frequency identification is a freedom taker. And what I mean by that is just what Eric said, MCOOL provides liberty and freedom of choice to the individual consumer. It also pro provides liberty to um, the producer, uh, where radio frequency identification uh, uh, is a liberty taker in that it is just what Eric said a while ago, government bureaucratic overreach into private property rights and um, knowledge on things that maybe they shouldn't have knowledge on. You see, when you start comparing uh, liberty makers to liberty takers. I'm going to be uh, in favor of a liberty maker all day long. There is no negative connotations with mandatory country of origin labeling. They can put all the spin on it they want. It creates choice uh, where the mandatory RFID takes away uh, it, it, uh, private property rights. It infringes on your personal liberty. And uh, there's a whole scale between the two of difference. And uh, so that's where I stand on it. Well, <clears throat> pardon me, Bill Bullard. Tatum, Tatum yes, can sir. I interject? Yes, sir. We're talking. One of the things in our plan, and, and it goes to mandatory cool, I, I've got a, a couple things I want to bring out on that. Mandatory cool, and, and these guys have emphasized that it gives consumer choice, but Dr. Stephen Koontz from CSU that uh, NCBA uses a lot. 20 years ago, I was at a Red Book uh, uh, well, a group meeting. I think Kurt was there too. And uh, Dr. Koontz was a speaker. And, you know, every one of us thinks we're doing the very best job with the genetics, we're, or we try to. We attempt to do the very best job of raising a quality calf. And you know, our health protocol. But Dr. Kuntz that night, he really, first time I'd ever heard him, he really made me mad. He said, fellas, you got to remember you're in the commodity business. So I want to take this uh, and narrow it in from a producer side, why we need M. Cool. And our plan speaks to, and this is a distinction between our plan and, and NCBA's plan. Our plan speaks to improving the domestic beef business. Uh, we talked about bottom line, but that's everyone on this call. Uh, we want to improve the profitability of the U.S. producers. And with mandatory cool, now think about what Dr. Kuntz said. We're in the commodity business. Without mandatory cool, you, in the commodity business, you want to do something to differentiate your product in the retail space. Right now, we're getting screwed because we're competing with imports that are being mislabeled with a US label because they're harvested here. And our plan addresses that. And that's why we need M Cool from a producer standpoint. We need to differentiate our product in the retail marketplace. Uh, why do you think that uh, uh, exporters or processors want to label our product as you, you, a product of the USA? It has this great connotation with the Japanese, the Chinese, and they're making all the money. I mean, the other people's plan talks about increasing exports. Well, who makes the money? It's not the US producers, it's the people that process and export. So back to MCOOL, Tatum and, and people out there, we need MCOOL not just to give consumers the right to choose and to support uh, a domestic industry, which contributes to food security. There's a lot of things in our plan that we talk about, but MCOOL is very integral to working for the consumers, working for the producers and putting more money in our pocket. And, and the capability, 
a lot of things, you know, oh, it costs too much. Where was the cost when we had it for the two years that it was legitimate? I think it was a little over two years, wasn't it, Bill? From 13 through 15, uh, where was the cost? Every, everybody uses barcodes, every animal that goes down an assembly line there, whether it's beef or pork, is tracked. There's no cost there already gathering that information. That's, that's a bogus argument, but we need MCOOL and we need it for producers and consumers. Absolutely. I, I would say, and I know that I have some staff monitoring our comments. So if one of you can put up the cool chart, otherwise I'll, I'll put that cool chart in the comments later. Gerald, I'm so glad you brought that up because when we were in, um, when we were in Fort Worth at the NFR, we had some hecklers come over to us that worked for the beef council. Texas Beef Council. And one of the things that they said, and, and they always say this, those on the other side always say, cool costs us, cool cost the producers. So back, you know, so to your point, Eric, RFID tags costing the actual producer versus cool. Um, Bill, does cool cost the producer? And does our mandatory RFID cost the producer? Let's just get that out. What, where are we going to lose money? Well, country boards labeling, for example, is currently in use by the multinational meat packers that export beef from the United States to about 57 different countries. And they proudly put the product of USA label on that beef. Now they have to track that beef all the way back to the animal so that they can make a accurate declaration as to the origin and they're doing that now. So the cost associated with country of origin labeling, as Gerald said, is already a part of the infrastructure of the industry that we're involved in. There are no additional costs. The problem right now is that the, the same meat packers that are putting a USA label on beef that's being shipped abroad refuses to put the label on domestic beef to be sold to the domestic market because they know that consumers uh, are going to exercise choice that many will choose the exclusively born, raised, and slaughtered in the USA product, and that will create new demand for USA cattle. And they want to be able to unilaterally decide where they obtain their cattle. And if the consumer makes the choice for them, it takes away the power from the multinational corporations. So this isn't a matter of cost. This is a matter of who benefits from depriving the American cattle producer the opportunity to showcase their superior product in the market. And, and this leads us right to the, this issue of the strategy that we have to preserve and protect the liberties and freedoms of US cattle producers, uh, because one of the objectives of this strategy is we want to ensure that beef sold abroad bearing a USA label is actually derived exclusively from animals born, raised, and slaughtered in the United States. And that's not the case today, because today they can put a USA label on the meat from any animal slaughtered in the United States. That means the meat could be exclusively from animals imported from Canada or Mexico, and yet when sold abroad bears the USA label. That has to stop, and this plan incorporates that specific strategy to do just that. Such fraud. I mean, it's really, it's fraud. <clears throat> I would encourage you, if you're watching, um, please go to www.r-calfusa.com. On our homepage, we have listed the RCAF Long Range Plan. I'm going to read, because I had not done that yet, <clears throat> the, the point that we're speaking of the, to preserve and protect the liberties and freedoms of U.S. cattle producers. One, stop government overreach by prohibiting the U.S. Department of Agriculture from mandating premise registration, radio frequency ID, RFID, or certifications associated with production practices. Number two, empower U.S. cattle producers to hold the government-controlled beef checkoff program accountable by conducting periodic producer referendums on the beef checkoff. Number three, encourage development of export markets, just like you were talking about, Bill, for beef exclusively born, raised, and harvested in the U.S. while ensuring the adoption 
of export related production and verification standards remains purely voluntary. Number four, reverse the government's restrictions and limits on grazing and water rights on federally managed lands and restore the allotment owners surface rights so they could manage their own operations, which Shad will get to in a minute. But I wanna talk right now, Kurt Warner, about the beef checkoff, because as I just mentioned, there are no sunsets on this checkoff that was originally voted on in the 80s, in the original, or in the 1988, I believe, farm bill. Talk to us a little bit about your opinion on this beef checkoff. Our calf is running a petition right now um, checkoffvote.com. Please go to checkoffvote.com. Sign the petition if you have not and share it with your neighbors. The USDA has said you need at least 80,000 signatures to be able to have a beef checkoff referendum. And so that deadline for us is in July. Talk to us about the beef checkoff program and your opinion on having a sunset and voting on this federally mandated tax that generally goes to several private entities? Well, um, the checkoff is 35 years old. So what that means is there are, are a lot of people in the industry, um, I guess you call them relatively young when it comes to cattle producers, but have never had the opportunity to have a say in to the dollar, the dollar per head or depending on what, what state they're in. Uh, that mandatory tax, they've never had an opportunity to to weigh in on that. Um, as you talk to, to producers, um, a lot of them, you know, they just, they take it for granted. This is something that's been there forever. You know, they might uh, uh, hear, a, you know, a, a checkoff advertisement on the Broncos game. But other than that, they don't really understand it very much. I did have one young man, uh, I talked to him about signing the referendum petition. And he said, do you have some more for me to sign? Uh, I, I've got lots of people that I'd, I'd like to, to get to sign up. He said, you know, he's also a corn producer. He said, you know, they just nickel and dime us to death. He said, it's so much a bushel of corn, you know, it's so much uh, a bushel of wheat. And he said, when they get done, he said, where does it go? And what do we have to show for it? If, if you're a, uh, a cow calf producer, stalker operator, your percentage of the retail dollar in 2020 will be the smallest by by far. So uh, if you've been in the cattle industry for very long, which most people have, most people put thousands and thousands of dollars into the checkoff, what do they really have to show for it today? You look at their, the areas, they, uh, can you say, well, you know, uh, the beef industry has really benefited my, my small town when it's, uh, the buildings are all empty. Uh, no, that, that money has just disappeared. And uh, there's no indication that's come back to actually help the producer. And a discussion last, um, the last meeting uh, you folks had was the difference between uh, the cattle industry and the beef industry. And they finally have actually come out and said, well, there's a difference. The cattle industry and beef industry are two separate entities. If that's true, then why are the cattle producers spending a dollar per head, sending, I think, around $34 million um, in, in checkoff money, a lot of it going to NCBA. If, there's a, if they're two separate entities, they're, they're wasting their money. They're getting no return whatsoever. If the, if the beef industry and the cattle industry are two separate entities, um, they have nothing to show for it. <laughs> yeah, you know, Bill Bullard, I was going to come to you. Here's the irony. The beef checkoff has done its job, right? In terms of building beef demand, the, if you go to any foreign country, U.S. beef is the most revered beef on the planet. The problem is that domestically in the United States, which we have as American citizens, the most, the strongest buying power of all the world, and they're not promoting USA beef here in America. Talk to us about that and just how ridiculous that is. And then lead us into point number three, which is of course the government bureaucrats and how we've got to hold the line. So, so there's no question that 
there has been someone along the beef supply chain that has benefited greatly from the tens of millions of dollars contributed by cattle producers. And the CME group uh, sent out a report today and that said on December 26, the packer margin was $410 a head. Um, that's a near record. Uh, that's exceptionally high. And that makes uh, that part of the industry extremely profitable. You look at the cattle producer, on the other hand, at fed cattle prices hovering around the $110 or less, you're looking at decades old prices. So cattle producers are receiving decades old prices. Meat packers, according to reports, are earning record margins and consumers are paying the highest prices in history for the beef they're purchasing in the grocery store. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to determine who in the supply chain has been making all the money uh, from the mandatory tax that cattle producers have been paying for decades. And that has to change. And that's why the plan um, incorporates at least the opportunity for producers to have a say, as Kurt said, in this process. Uh, you know, and leading to the next issue, uh, the issue of we now have a legal and regulatory framework that like other programs have not benefited the cattle producers. They've been ill served uh, by the current framework that we operate under. And the, the best example of that is uh, what happened as a result of the pandemic. Every cattle producer in this country knew that the market was dysfunctional for at least the past five years. Everyone knew that definitively. And yet no decision maker, no policymaker, no member of Congress stood forward or no, no industry representative stood up to make any changes until we had what Eric described, the Holcomb, uh, Kansas fire and the COVID pandemic and suddenly consumers were harmed by this dysfunctional marketplace. And only now do we have any meaningful interest in how our uh, industry is dysfunctional, not how it's operating. Uh, they're focusing on the weaknesses of our industry, weaknesses that only exist uh, because we've been asleep at the wheel, if you will, and we've allowed other segments of this industry to drive, uh, drive us into the ground, and that's where we're at. So uh, that's why the plan is necessary. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about, well, what is an independent producer? Well, an independent producer simply cannot be independent if they continue to depend on bureaucrats and other industry, conventional industry uh, representatives in order to preserve the very market from which that independence flows. Independent cattle producers are independent because they operate in a free market system and they allow the competitive forces of a marketplace to, to accord them that independence. That's not, that's, that doesn't exist today and we've got to bring it back. And, uh, and you can't bring it back without a well thought out plan. And that's what this board has put together. A well thought out plan to suddenly elevate uh, the stature of the most important sector of the entire beef supply chain. And that's everyone on that, that's the board members and the affiliate president on this call. They're the people who are providing the, uh, the calves that are working their way downstream into the supply chain and, uh, and this is an extremely profitable industry on the beef side, but it has not been for cattle producers. And the only way that's gonna change is if cattle producers stepped to the plate and said, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna take back control over this industry. And that's what we're attempting to do. You know what, Gerald, the next question's for you. And as Bill said, I am mad. As a producer, I'm looking at our analytics right now. We have averaged between 40 and 60 people, 40, 40 to 55 ish, this whole call. And you know what? We have how many how many producers left in this country, Bill? 700 and something. 729,000. 729,000 people. Every cattle producer in America should be just as mad as we are and fighting just as hard as we are. And so I'm going to ask you, you know, well, let me read this first. Here's the next point. Reform the cattle industry's legal and regulatory framework 
so that U.S. cattle producers can protect the marketplace on their own. Number one, implement regulations to clarify that cattle producers subject to unfair packer buying practices do not need to show injury to competition to obtain protection under the law. Number two, implement a law or regulation to clarify that packers engaged in unfair or deceptive conduct that harms cattle producers cannot claim a business justification for their actions. And number three, amend the law to allow cattle producers to recover attorney fees after successfully enforcing provisions of the Packers and Stockyards Act. Dad gum, how do we hold the line as independent producers, Gerald, when our government bureaucrats are ignoring us? Well, that's kind of a catch-22, Tatum, because we're all under of the understanding that even though we're in the greatest country in the world and we have uh, vehicles, uh, we have a PNS. Thank goodness for Teddy Roosevelt and then. But if it isn't enforced and and this uh, outgoing, I don't mean to disparage Mr. Purdue, but money buys access to enforcement. And so that's why it's incumbent. As I understand, uh, what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to keep the pressure on. We don't have the money. You know, it takes, and this is why a lot of things have gone against us in Congress, but, but it's unfortunate that our Secretary of Agriculture hasn't uh, looked out for producers, whether they be farmers or ranchers. And we've got to turn up the heat uh, as I mentioned earlier, the only thing I know, and, and Bill has talked to this, the board recognizes it. I think we've got 5,700 members, we're growing. We need 10 to 15,000 to put the pressure on uh, the Secretary of Agriculture and our legislators so they listen to us. We don't have the money uh, uh, in a lobby fund that, that some of these other groups do. Uh, as a case in point, the packing industry. Uh, Bill just mentioned, if they're making $410 a head, uh, and, and Eric, back to his point, uh, cow calves, uh, if you're lucky this fall, a uh, six weight steer is gonna bring you somewhere in the 150 to 160 range. If you do some of the special programs, uh, back to RFID, you might pick up another $10, you know, if you're going in the natural and in HTC and, and all those programs, but that's a pimple on an elephant's butt and it doesn't compare at all to the $410 that the Packers making. So Tatum, we've got to turn up the calls. Uh, the, the rules are there, although some of them have been uh, taken away from us. I mean, we still have the structure of a PNS, but the, to these points, the, uh, those were brought up and they were called the fair practices uh, addition and uh, what we saw under this secretary of agriculture, he, he basically put the PNS under the agriculture marketing service and made it less of a standalone agency. So we've got to turn up the pressure. We need to grow our membership. And uh, you know, it's all right to be loyal to, to the general farm organization that your family's been in for three generations. It's all right to be loyal to uh, National Cattlemen's, but look at what's happening to our industry. We've talked about it over and over tonight. Exports are, are going up. Uh, everybody's making money, but the fellow that produces and takes all the risk on our end. So uh, to answer your question in a convoluted way, uh, we have got to hold Mr. Vilsack if he comes in I guess we've just got to call, call, call. I know, I know. Ah, Tatum. la la la. But, but, but it, we've got to deal with the people with the hand that uh, is dealt us. And uh, I don't know. We don't have the money to lobby, so it's going to take phone call after phone call. Um, I don't know how to answer you otherwise. But <clears throat> no, Chef uh, Sullivan. We've, I we've got a plan. <laughs> we've got a template, and uh, we're not just blowing hot air and and using verbiage to sound good to the act press. And that's the other thing. Thank God for these Facebook and internet because President Trump called the regular news fake. Well, we've got fake in the ag news. We have a hard time 
breaching the platform? I mean, Bill, how many national news services have you been contacted? You know, I see print media, Tri-State covered our, our plan and interviewed uh, Brent and, and some of the other fellows. But, you know, we've got fake ag news, Tatum. So we've got to work yes, you know, we do. against a lot of obstacles to get our message out there. Chad Sullivan, we need, if we have 700 and some mem, 700 and some thousand producers in this country, everybody should be absolutely, I don't want to say up in arms because we're on a public forum and they'll take me literally, but people should be, people are losing their livelihoods. I have, there's one of our comments. We're going to go to our comments real quick and then I'm going to go to you, Chad. Um, and again, thank you so much for tuning in. Plus, pr press the share button. Share this with everybody you know, producers, cattle producers, bring them on board. This gal says, we've been listening and we are mad. Went to the bank today after 40 years in business. We continue to go backwards the last five years. Shad Sullivan, talk to us about what we need to do to get cattle producers on board because people are mad. They're hurting. And why is everybody else, why is everybody not on board with this? This is, it's, it's a crisis. This is a crisis. Well, it's a crisis that runs downhill because right now we're in a constitutional crisis in America. But uh, I want to go back to what uh, Gerald said. I have great respect for Gerald and uh, all of these guys on the board. But I want to, I, I just want to, I just want to put the truth out there. If we don't end corruption, we cannot go forward in our industry. And, this, and, and that's what I'm talking about runs downhill. Number one, we need term limits. Number two, we need to, and this is gonna sound radical, we need to make lobbying illegal. The pay to play scheme in the agriculture industry has been so devastating to these independent operations that it is sickening. We have a, a, a secretary of agriculture that, that actually said, um, get big or get out. He quoted that. He said, get big or get out. Then he told a myriad of jokes about independent farmers that disparaged them. That is not a guy that's on our team. These are globalists. We are working. We have to decide as independent producers, if we're going to work uh, as, as national producers, and, and people will take me being a nationalist as a bad thing. I'm a nationalist because I love my country. Mm -hmm. And I, I will stand for it every day. And this beef industry is so corrupt and so interwoven with uh, those organizations that spread out through these industries. You do not, I mean, our, the biggest uh, uh, receiver of checkoff funds has done nothing, nothing to defend independent, independent producers. Then we have Farm Bureau. Why is Farm Bureau making decisions for the American producer? They get a little bit of checkoff money too. This is corrupt. Pay to play must end. We have to get this lobbying money out of these organizations. On, a, on August 9th, 2019, we had a fire in Holcomb, Kansas that devastated our industry overnight. I was, I was trying to sell cattle. I was livid. I was upset. Everything that my uh, family has worked for was on the line. It was on the line. Now, the Lord has blessed me and showed me favor. But I made so many calls during that time. And one particular call I made was to the Denver office of the Packers and Stockyards. And um, I asked them if they were going to investigate. What are their thoughts? Help me out. I was a kind. I was very kind. I wasn't angry. I know I come off as angry sometimes. I'm not angry. I, I'm, I'm upset. Because I'm we, angry. We well, we have allowed ourselves to get in a position where now it's like a caged badger. They put your back up against the wall. They get you in a corner. You come out swinging, and you're the bad guy. I'm sorry. The the gentleman at the PNS office told me. He says this is just a regular uh, result uh, from supply and demand issues. And I said, Are you telling me overnight? You can devastate an industry overnight on the issue of su supply and demand when we haven't even been working off of supply and demand in years, years. People uh, are in trouble. They have been in trouble five years. And uh, this corruption, it all, I'll say it again, I'll say it till the day I die. Until we end corruption, 
disruption in the cattle and beef industry. We cannot go forward. We have to cross those breaking antitrust laws. We have to, and as producers, we have to get up and talk. And, and I know people are tired of hearing me. And one of these days, I'm just going to say, you know what? We're done. I'm done because I, I, I've worked hard. I believe it or not, I, I've, I've been at my job for 28 years. I've had a good run, but the last five have been a train wreck, an absolute disaster. And it's not because I, I, I produce bad or I mismanage. It's because of other uh, outside uh, uh, aspects coming in and ruining what we work hard to do. And these, these when you, when you just angered me a little bit when you said you had a 40 year producer go to the bank and talk like that. 40 years is more than, you're way past the prime of your life. They've been in business 40 years and they're still struggling. And the last five have been the worst. This is a land of prosperity. This is the land of, of redemption. We are, this is the land of capitalism. This is our last holdout in the world to make our dreams come true. And because of corruption, a globalist versus nationalist corruption, we're not able to do that. And we have to end it. And it's only going to end when 72 million people, and I'm, I'm not talking uh, about Trump. I'm saying 72 million people uh, voted for Trump these people have to stand up if they want uh, and talk. And it's the same in the cattle industry. 729,000 people have to get up and say, hey, I want a level playing field. I want a fair shot at this because my kids deserve it and I deserve a little bit of, a, of an award. Am I willing to risk? Yes, that's the true virtue of cattle, capitalism. I'm willing to risk the weather. I'm willing to risk those outside forces that that have a, an effect on our market systems, but I'm not willing to put my time and effort in and pay uh, all of these taxes uh, without some sort of reward. I had an individual uh, ask me, an NCBA member, good friend, ask me, Shed, what, where would you be at if you had all of your um, checkoff dollars over the last, since 1985, returned to you. And I said, you know what? We'd have a paid for ranch and a lot of money in the bank. And we would. I look at that dollar and, I, and I'm, and listen, I'm pro checkoff. When I was a little kid, man, we come out, uh, we, they educated us in the school um, and, and they did a lot of great things. But as with everything else, it has become corrupt. Money and power corrupts. Money and power corrupts, especially when there's no checks and balances. So we have to get back there. And the checks and balances have to be the independent producer standing up and say, no more, it's done, no more. And I'll leave it at that. Amen. It is corrupt. And we as producers have to push back. Some of you know, some of you don't know, because I don't talk about it on here. <clears throat> but if you're an RCAF member, you know, I ran for state representative here in a, special, in a special election just a couple of months ago, Shad, actually two weeks ago, and I was elected. And last week, our committee assignments came out. I don't think I've told you this, Gerald. And I was not put on the agriculture committee. And you know what I was told? KLA made a phone call. I live in Kansas. KLA made a phone call because RCAF's coming to Topeka. And you know what? I... We as independent producers, I'm a fifth generation producer. Many of you, I don't know what you are. You're Chad, what are you? Fifth generation, sixth? On, I mean, how many of you? We've been producing for a long time. I only got involved with our calf because I was mad. Because we have to do something to push back. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you, Eric. We have to get involved. I know you're very political. You got involved with our calf because you finally said enough is enough. And it's not that I, I want to say there's a there was a comment that came through and it was hold on one second. Uh Ron Folk said this, our good friend from North Dakota. He goes, Hey Shad, we've been beaten up for years. It's not radical, it's survival. And that's good. So I'm going to ask you this, Eric, even though you're relatively new to RCAP, have you been surprised at the government's unwillingness to be able to get involved and go to protect? I mean, we're the largest piece of American agriculture. We feed those people. That's what I said when I went to Topeka. They can say whatever they want to, but we feed them. Were you surprised? Because I think most producers are surprised that the government really hasn't gone to bat for us. 
No, and they're kind of totally against us. I called my senators and congressmen all last spring, weekly. Their uh, ag advisors know me by name and apparently know how to duck my calls and know my number <laughs> so they don't have to pick up. Cause they would call me back for a while. They don't do much anymore because I've gotten pretty disgusted and told them what I thought. But it's flat amazing how we don't really matter and to them people. And it just blows my mind. And it's, I know in South Dakota with R3, to me, it's pretty clear who they stand with and what they believe. And, and this election's just brought that out even more to the table. So like you said, I'm pretty political and kind of speak my mind once in a while. And it's, uh, I don't know, we're dealing with some guys that need term limits. I know that. I tell you what, I, you know, people have joked with me and they've said, oh, Tatum, you want to be a politician? And I laugh at them and I say, absolutely not. What I want to do is save my freaking country. That's what I want to do. We had a really good friend, didn't we, uh, Gerald Schreiber, Kimmy Lewis. She was the RCAP legislator of the year last year. We gave her our, our actually, no, I'm sorry, two years ago, Grassley was our, our um, legislator of the year last year. Kimmy was our award winner. We have to get involved, run for office, sign up to be part of whether it's our calf or whether it's a local group, align yourself with people that are fighting for you. Um, and that's why we're so thankful that you're on board with us, Kurt, because you're leading a group of liberty minded Americans in Colorado. Um, yeah, that's, that's very true. Colorado's a, a unique state. Uh, um, 20 years ago was probably considered a somewhat rural state. Today it's a, it's an urban state. And, uh, um, it's, what's very interesting is that, uh, uh, when Kimmy Lewis was in the legislature, she, uh, introduced several bills to, uh, uh, on a state level for mandatory uh, labeling of beef. Uh, we've had a lot of opposition from um, other ag organizations, but um, uh, her daughter, Corey, uh, helped write another bill, been the third bill of that kind this last year and we ran it. And our biggest allies were Democrats. Uh, they don't like the big packers any more than we do. And of course, with the the uh, the antitrust lawsuit that uh, uh, our calf has has filed, there was also a consumer uh, a companion su uh, consumer suit filed at the same time. Consumers are, are more and more aware of of what's going on because of things like social media, uh, and so it's a, it's a it's an unusual situation that while we would disagree on on a great many things. Um, with some of our urban uh, friends and neighbors, uh, there are some things that we agree on. And I think it's, it's very important that uh, we try to find those, those areas that we agree on um, and you know, to help our industry as well as the consumer. <clears throat> you know, I, we're, hey, going to, we're gonna, yes, sir. I always have to jump on. No, uh, you're fine. Uh, a very key point of our long range plan is, is working with consumers. And sometimes uh, RCAP gets blasted uh, and it's kind of hypocritical by, by the ag press and, and the large uh, cattle organization that we work with some, some consumer groups. But isn't that, this is what it's all about. We're producing products for the consumers. The other group's plan says they wanna be transparent, but yet, they do not want consumers to know where their beef comes from. Back to our M. Cool bill. So how can you have that as a bullet point in your long range plan? I'm asking you NCBA members, and we uh, are fighting so they have the right to know where their beef comes from. Consumers are very important to NARCAP. They're not, uh, we wanna work with them. We don't, as Kurt said, we don't agree with all of, uh, we don't want them telling us how to produce. Uh, that's our right and our individual liberty. I don't think, uh, and I don't think most of them want to tell us how to produce, but uh, 
Consumers are very important. That's a distinction in our plan and the other plan. Another thing, and, and Bill, I don't wanna usurp your clothes, but uh, I understand that Monday, the other group is coming out with their 75% uh, voluntary, you know, trying to uh, uh, make the cash market and, and it's pure. It doesn't even figure out 75%. Our plan is very specific about making sure that 50% of the cattle are marketed and we've got target dates in our plan. Uh, we want to end captive supply. We, we don't want to go to the government. The president, uh, Bill, uh, a paper just came out, a magazine yesterday called Working Ranch, and it featured RCAF, NCBA, and USCA uh, for 2020 and, and going into the future. And I thought it curious that one of the things the NCBA president and probably everybody on this call took some COVID and care money, but that doesn't fix a market. Our long range plan doesn't look to government handouts to fix our market. We're looking at fixing competition and uh, we've got the bullet points. We've got, we say how we're gonna do it. And uh, one of the things is to get cash cattle sales up to 50%. How could, I don't know how any cattle producer could be against uh, the Grassley tester bill. We, it's in, imperative that we pass that thing. And maybe with uh, Senator Roberts going out the door, out of your good state of Kansas, uh, Tatum, maybe we'll get uh, a decent uh, chair of the Ag Senate Ag Committee. But anyway, uh, we've got specific things. And we're, we talk about how we're gonna increase competition. And one of them is so making sure these packers buy 50% of their cattle in the cash market and then getting rid of captive supply. We don't talk about it, we want it done. Amen, Gerald. And that goes back to what Shad, you know, and I know that it was, I don't feel like it was a rabbit trail, but it wasn't exactly a, a, of our a, about our plan, but there is corruption and we need to expose the corruption. And, you know, what was happening with Pat Roberts was a travesty. He would not let that 5014 bill out of committee. And that's so so we can certainly pray that the new chairman of the Ag Committee will will try to allow Grassley's bill out of committee or we can do a workaround. <clears throat> you know, Bill Bullard, our good friend Brett Kinsey, who is our board member from South Dakota, he represents South Dakota, North Dakota, and Nebraska. Uh, a few months ago we were having a conversation and he had a fella on his place who was in his 60s and he was not an RCAF fan, this guy. And and Brett said, well, um, he asked him a question. He said, mister, when is the, when are the two times you've made the most money in the cattle business? And he goes, oh, that's easy, 2014. And Brett said, well, he goes, what happened in 2014 that would cause you to make, you know, good money? And he goes, well, I don't know, but I bet you're going to tell me. And Brett said, yes, I am. And he goes, we had country boards and labeling in place. And he goes, so you had your trademark. And he goes, consumers could decide. He goes, um, what about the second time you've made the most money in the cattle business? And he goes, oh, that was easy. 2004 and 2005, he goes, when we were able to close that border to Canada. And Brett just kind of chuckled and he goes, okay, well, tell me, uh, how did that border to Canada get closed? And of course, this fella not being stupid kind of, he goes, well, I bet you're going to tell me that RCAF was probably behind that too. And he goes, I sure am. In 2004, RCAF petitioned the USDA and was able to get the border closed to Canada, which is when we had uh, great cattle prices. And so talk to us about how RCAF has worked within that government framework to really advocate to protect our own markets. Because those are two examples when we fought for cool and when we fought to get that Canadian border closed. And so give some people some hope as to what we can do moving forward. Well, we did what an organization does, and that is it takes the collective voices of its members and it turns those voices into action. And so every producer knows that if you maintain the highest health and safety standards of the world, you're going to be rewarded. And that was the essence of our litigation back then, was to protect the health and safety of the U.S. cattle herd from a known threat. And as a result of our success, producers in the United States were rewarded 
uh, at the time with some of the highest returns on a per bred cow basis than we'd ever seen before in our history. And uh, the same is true with the 2014 and 15. Uh, we fought hard for decades for mandatory country boards and labeling. It was implemented. Consumers could choose to support the American domestic supply chain, the American rancher, and many of them did. And uh, so we just have to implement the common sense ideas that uh, our members all across the country know are the right things to do and they need an organization in order to implement them. And that's why the stronger we are as an organization, the more we will get done. And we've already gotten done uh, more than, well, I'll let producers decide whether or not what we have gotten done has benefited them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> With that, we are after, we are, we are over our hour and I appreciate this conversation. I would encourage everyone who is listening every week, that we have these Facebook Lives. We have an influx of members that come on board. And to that, I say thank you so much. We are just people, we're ranchers, we're producers, we are farmers, and we're just trying to do what we think is right to fight for our livelihoods. As was spoken on this Facebook Live, one of the comments was, this, it's not about being radical, it's just about trying to survive. So we would ask you, please come on board with us. Please join us. Please run for office. Please sign a petition. Please do whatever you can to fight back because the heart and soul for our country uh, is literally on the line. So go to www.r-calfusa.com forward slash membership. Join us, it's $50 a month. Join your neighbor, join your son, join your wife. Here's why membership numbers are important. I can assure you it's not for your $50. Here's what it's about. When we go to DC, Bill is our registered lobbyist. And they say, how many people do you represent? Because politicians think in terms of votes, right? So they, they want to know how many votes does this actually mean for me? We must join together. Again, this plan, it's not about NCBA. It's not about RCAP. This is a grassroots producer plan to just survive. And Kurt, you're right. We may not have five years. I'm going to open it up to you all. Any last comments that you may have? And then I'm going to say thank you so much for joining us. We're almost done with 2020, y'all. One more day. Any last comments? No, thank you so much. Well, wait, wait, wait. Yes. Yes. Well, I just I, I'll go ahead, Bill. Oh, I just uh, you know I I want to reiterate what you just said, and that's encourage uh, the American producer to come on board with RCAF USA and uh, take a moment to sign that petition, that checkoff petition. It's uh, very important that today's producers have that opportunity to choose to vote on that referendum, or at least to try and get a referendum. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a part of who we are as an American uh, to be able to vote. And I, and I also wanna thank Bill Bullard for be, always being spot on for us and the rest of the board. And uh, I, I wanna wish just 2020 has been a long year for me. And I just wanna wish every producer out there uh, a hearty 2021. I wanna wish every consumer Eat USA beef, demand it everywhere you go, and uh, come on board with this. Amen. Anybody else? Bill Buller, did you have something to say? Well, I may have misheard you, but our membership is $50 per year for new members, correct? Yes, $50 a year. Is that what I said? I don't I know. I thought if you I said a month. Oh, sorry. $50 a year. So cheap. It's so cheap. Um, I might have said $50 a month. I'm sorry. No, $50 a year. We are so thankful. If you're an RCAF member, thank you so much. We are funded, unlike the Beef Checkoff, which, which supports different associations to the tune of 
$45 million a year. Our CAF does not take checkoff funds. We've never taken checkoff funds. We are only supported by producers. That's how Bill Bullard travels. That's how I travel. That's how, that's how everything is done. And so thank you. Thank you so much for supporting us in 2020. Um, we just couldn't do it without y'all. Thank you so much, Kurt Warner, for being on here. I appreciate you. Uh, I don't know if this was your debut Zoom. I think it was. Was this your first Zoom, Kurt? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yes, it was. Look at you ranchers thinking outside the box and coloring outside the lines. Thank you so much, Eric Groper, Bill Bullard, Gerald Schreiber, Shad Sullivan. Happy New Year, you all, and thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.